Welcome to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Welcome to the Means of Grace podcast. My name is Brian Matier, and I am the Associate Director of Missional Engagement for the Western North Carolina Conference. And today I'm joined by Chris Myers, the um, Mission Engagement Associate for the Uari District, and Laura Birch, the Pastor of Community Engagement for Boone United Methodist Church. And we're going to talk to you today about uh, a blog uh, titled 10 Questions to Consider When Rethinking This Summer Mission Experiences. Um, so I wonder if, if you, Laura, um, could tell us a little bit about um, the origin of, of the blog entry and, and, and why we felt uh, from a mission engagement perspective that it was important to, to share this with, with our conference. A few of us on the missional engagement operations team of the conference were talking about uh, just how to rethink what we were doing in missions this summer as we uh, knew that a lot of mission trips and mission experiences were being canceled and needing to be uh, redesigned because of COVID-19. And um, as we ourselves were, were thinking about how in our local contexts and, and how in churches we knew around us, uh, folks were, were feeling um, different pressures and how to do that, we, we thought it would be helpful to, to think through some of the the different questions that should be in our minds as we were making those, those plans. And so the blog really came out of a, a conversation. You know, I, th- I think our initial uh, conversation was going to be based around something, uh, a, a virtual offering or, or, or some guidelines from a virtual offering. Um, so can you tell us how we, we kind of landed on these, these 10 questions? So as we were having conversation about the options to move virtually or what that could look like, um, I have just finished e-learning for my children. Now I have six children at home. And so they are Zoomed out and e learning out and I'm Zoomed out and e- e-learning out. And so as we kept talking about it, I just like, I just thought, man, is this really what kids need this summer? Is this really what young people need? Do adults really need more virtual something this summer? Why are we talking about even just straight moving to virtual options? And for me, that that spurred this thinking, well, why are we even thinking about reimagining? Maybe that's the first question that we ask. And maybe that's the place we start. Are we... Are we thinking about doing something different or reimagining the trip because that's what people really want? Or is it because we feel like as clergy, as church staff, um, as community organizers, are we really more feeling like, well, we need to do something because we've always done it and I still have a job and so I need to somehow justify my job. And I think that, you know, thinking through that really just spurred sort of the rest of the questions. It got to the first question uh, in the blog post and then that just sort of sort of snowballed into some of the rest of the questions. Yeah, I think, um, I think we're all in leadership positions kind of uh, feeling that internal pressure, um, that pressure to, to, um, uh, to maybe help in, in this time of, of, of crisis and change and, and try to figure out ways to um, maybe to be useful or to be valuable. So um, Laura, tell me about kind of, kind of your thoughts on that and, and, and how you're seeing that from, from your perspective. Yeah. I, th- I think that as Chris was saying, so often it can, we, we feel this internal pressure to, to need to create something um, when in reality we haven't heard from the the community um, what it is that that they're feeling the need for and that community being both the potential participants on on the mission trip as well as the on the ground community partners wherever we were going to be going whether that was somewhere close to home or somewhere on the other side of the world sometimes we we get really in our heads <laughs> about that and so um, that first question was was really trying to to encourage self-reflection on where is the pressure coming from for us to create a, a virtual experience or some kind of alternative experience 
Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I remember the conversation well between um, the MET ops team and, um, you know, the, the question or, or kind of the, the, um, the priority of what we, we thought we needed to do really shifted uh, in, in a quick manner, um, shifted away from um, of this idea of, 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 of doing something virtually to, to something that uh, really for, for people to reflect on and, and to consider. Um, so, so one of the, um, I think one of the takeaways from that and, and some of the things that, that members of, of that team did was to, to kind of ask around um, youth leaders and mission leaders and, and things of, of how they were feeling. And I remember a couple of conversations with, with youth leaders and, and they were really feeling the loss of, uh, uh, not being able to have something particularly for their seniors, uh, this year and, and, and feeling, uh, feeling that pressure to, to, um, help them to have that experience in their, their last year. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you guys are seeing a, that kind of pressure in your, in your situations and scenarios. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was, was one of y'all who said this or someone, if it was our youth director, but yeah, just the seniors really have been, I think on a lot of people's hearts as they were going to have their first or their last international mission trip. They were going to, you know, have that last experience together as youth group members. And um, the feedback came in that, you know, trying to do something virtually would almost feel more like a slap in the face <laughs> that, that it, it just wouldn't compare in any way to the experience of getting to be together. Uh, and so I know something that our church has considered is inviting those high school seniors back next year to, you know, or whatever point the trip is able to be rescheduled that, that they would be allowed to, to come back and participate, even though they're technically out of the youth group and that that would, would be a more meaningful way to to have them participate than trying to create something virtual or even something local in person where everyone has to stay six feet apart and you can't all you know sleep in the same space and <laughs> eat meals together. Oftentimes, we think about um, mission, uh, particularly in the uh, the summer mission journey experience for for teenagers, as being a a place that you go or or somewhere that you go on a journey from or to. Um, so talk a little bit more about, um, kind of that, maybe that shift to, to local because, um, there isn't going to be a lot of opportunity probably this summer to, to travel. Um, so, um, we're going to have to really get, get creative and also, um, perhaps, um, really local. I mean, even like next door neighbor local. So I wonder if you could chat about that some. I think one of the things um, when we're talking about mission experiences, and you touched on it, Brian, we always think about going someplace, place, going there, going to th that group of people um, that are not near my home. And, you know, what if we thought about actually loving our neighbor, our next door neighbor, our neighbors on the street, sometimes um, in an effort to serve over there, we really overlook the opportunities to serve right next to us. And I think one of the questions in the, the blog post touches on that, you know, what would it look like to really look in our own community, in our own neighborhood with new eyes and build those relationships right in the immediate area where we live? Something for, for people to think about as they um, reimagine what mission experiences could be this summer. Yeah, I love that. And one of the, the resources that's included on the blog is a, a neighborhood walk exercise that really does invite us, just like you said, to imagine, you know, what is our own context, literally where we live? <laughs> what, is, what, what is unique about it? What are the gifts there? What is God doing there? And I'm really inviting reflection on that. And I, I think this summer is a, a beautiful opportunity to get to dive in and maybe rediscover the place that that we've been seeing a lot of as we've as we've been staying at home and and i think one of the other places that that led us is also in our conversation thinking about if we can't go or do something together this summer in terms of hands on serving um do we maybe take this opportunity to to 
dive deep and to um, do some learning together. There are a lot of great resources uh, that that help us rethink what is what is the purpose of short term missions? How do we do short term missions well? How do we move from a place of just giving relief and short term kind of handouts to a place of of empowerment? And so this summer could really be an opportunity, and and this could be whether it's youth or adults that we're we're talking about um, an opportunity for some study and some learning together. There's a shift that that I know we as, as conference mission folks have been talking about a lot of how do we shift our imagination about what we even mean by missions. Using this time when we can't physically be together to, to do some learning together could be another great shift to make during the summer. Even to, to really dig into the theology of mission, we don't have enough time on a mission experience to do that which is understandable. You're there to serve others, to serve another community, to to serve your own community, whatever it may be. But yeah, what if this was the time to reimagine what it meant, mission, or the mission of God, to understand why we do what we do? Maybe this is the summer to do that. Um, One of the the things that I was thinking about as you guys were talking was... um, you know, the, the, the power and the importance of partnership. And I know for, for me that has been involved in, in Haiti and uh, some of our, our, our mission in Haiti, um, it's really important to, to garner uh, trust and build trust and relationship with, with uh, community partners in country or community partners in a community, whether that's um, locally or regionally or or ten, to the ends of the earth, as is in said in, in Acts 1-8. But um, I wonder if y'all can talk about some of your experience with partnership, because uh, if we are in mission with others instead of in mission to others, um, then we're, 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 we're thinking more about how we can support people that are on the ground every day that have the cultural content context that that we might not always have as a foreigner or, a, or an outsider it's been it's been, been really interesting and beautiful to see I know in my local context we have a 15 year partnership with a church in Guatemala and um, we're supposed to be having a, an adult mission team go down to Guatemala in April and of course that wasn't able to happen, but to see the way that communication still happened between folks on the ground there, because there had been a long established relationship that, that we were able to still be in communication via Facebook and email and to hear about what was happening on the ground and to be able to, to send some emergency relief for some families that really needed that. And also to be able to uh, empower the church to, to take on some of the work that the mission team would have been doing and to still have folks on the ground there be able to, to carry some of that out, even though, you know, we wished that we could have been alongside them uh, doing it. Well, and I think this is a great time to really make sure we're listening to what our mission partners need with so many changes and needs happening because of COVID-19 Uh, yeah, they may simply just need the resources that we would have spent on a trip, whether, you know, it's airfare costs or food costs or what have you. Those funds may be better used for them to meet the needs of the local um, community, for um, skilled workers in their area who are out of work to be hired to do the work that volunteer, perhaps unskilled (laughs) participants on a mission journey would have Um, come and participated in. It it could be a whole lot of things, but I think really listening to what is the need now, the need of uh, communicated when the original trip was planned may be drastically different now. And so keeping those lines of communication open and not just between those who are planning the mission experience and the mission partners, but communicating those changes of need to the congregation that's supporting folks too, letting them know just because our trip has been canceled or postponed does not mean that the work is not happening still. And here's what's happening now. And here's how we can continue to partner with them, even though we're not going there. 
I think those are important conversations to have with the mission partners and with the local, the local church. What are, what are some, some ways that you can continue that line of communication with your congregation uh, and, and between um, your mission partners? Uh, um, how, how are some ways that people can stay connected uh, even though um, you, I, I mean, oftentimes I think when teams come back, there's a, there's a big burst of energy of around a mission because you have people excited about it. Um, can y'all think of some ways that might be helpful uh, to, to generate that, that communication and excitement, even though you might not have a team going this year? Well, I think you can use sort of some of the standard modes of communication. Maybe there's an email blast that goes out to the congregation that talks about what the mission partners are doing. Uh, website updates, social media posts. But I wonder, too, if the mission partner has the capabilities, the time, the resources, the technology. Maybe they could record a short video that could be shared with the congregation saying, hey, this is when your team was supposed to be here and we miss you, but here's the work that's still happening and we still would love your partnership and here's how you can continue to partner with us. If there's a possibility for mission partners to to make a video like that, that may be a great way to continue the partnership and the communication to the congregation. I think that's a great idea, um, Chris. The you know one thing I was thinking about is I've been in little corners uh, around the world, uh, you know, out in the the middle of nowhere, and and people still have cell phones. Uh, and so I I think those those uh, little short videos that could be captured on a on a cell phone camera or or some just some some photographs that can be sent to the church and and maybe even vice versa some you know some some a little video of uh, of um, encouragement from the church to to mission partners to to let them know that we're still supporting you that we're still praying for you and that that um, your work in, is valuable. Or gosh, even handwritten notes from the church to the mission partners. I know sometimes that happens, you know, maybe a kid's Sunday school class or something will draw pictures and cards and it gets sent with the mission team. Well, what if the whole church did that and just mailed it over there and encouraged them that way? I think the the possibilities really are very wide of how we can continue that support. I want to shift the conversation a little bit um, because you know, oftentimes we're working with organizations or nonprofits or, or individuals that they are reliant on, um, on, on teams coming uh, from a financial standpoint, um, you know, perhaps interpreters or, or drivers are paid or, um, or, or maybe there's a fleet fee collected for, um, for lodging or food or something like that. So um, it's going to be not only a loss of, of experience for our churches and our, and our teams, but it's going to be a loss of, of, of income for, um, for some that may be in, in, in reliant on, on those type of, of issues. Cause so, um, I know we've talked a little bit about this in, in our circles, but what are some ways that, that churches can continue to support, um, that way, uh, um, financially for, um, for, our, for our dear mission partners? As we mentioned earlier, finding creative ways of, of still sending funds, you know, if, if flight fees were refunded, still considering sending those down to partners is one way that I've seen teams doing that. And I think this is also maybe a chance for us to to look again at the long-term sustainability of how we engage in partnerships. Because on the one hand, yes, it's it's great that, you know, our mission trips help create jobs and, and livelihoods. But as, as we see in this moment, the devastation that that can bring when all of those mission trips are, have to be canceled. And so um, I wonder if, if this is again a, a time when we're exploring that whenever this, this whole thing is over, it might not be going back to normal, but exploring what is a new normal and what is, what is a step that we could take to, uh, to make sure that that our partnerships truly are mutual and not furthering uh, a sense of dependency. So we've talked a little bit about how how folks can get involved locally in their communities, um, and we've we've all been kind of forced to to reevaluate and, and look at ways that we can do that during this this time of COVID nineteen. 
Um, what are some ways your churches are, are reaching out to your communities in, in safe ways um, and perhaps creative ways that, uh, that has forced you to um, when you have to social distance? Um, what are some things that, that might not be your normal scope of, of mission work that you're, you're engaging in right now? We've had a lot of folks making masks <laughs> um, and getting those out to essential workers, to free boxes in the community that folks can either drop off masks or pick up masks um, as they're needed. And so that's been one kind of new way that we folks have been able to engage even from home and just really looking at, at other opportunities. So, you know, at our church, our weekly community meal has shifted to a, a drive through to go meal. So we've had folks, you know, a limited number of folks who are coming in and doing that, but other folks who are writing encouraging notes and, and leaving those in the boxes, those who are baking desserts at home and individually wrapping them and dropping them off at the church. And so really getting creative in, in some of those ways. And then I think there's also been more of a an awareness and a wanting to look at the big picture. As I've talked to friends who for the first time are experiencing unemployment and having to file for unemployment and are realizing some of the realities that so many of our neighbors face every day, but for them with their, with, you know, with college education and uh, coming from privileged backgrounds, it's been a new experience for them to, to experience some of these things, but it's, it's created a, a desire to want to change the systems, <laughs> to realize the injustice of, um, of that. And so, you know, that's still in the beginning s- stages, but I think there's an opportunity for our, our churches to, to really engage in some, some bigger system level change right now. I also think there's an opportunity to engage uh, a younger population of our churches so often, particularly during the school year, some of the ways that churches serve the community, they're happening during the day. And so a high volume of those volunteers, those unpaid servants, are people who are retired and available during the day. Well, now, since there's e-learning in place at the end of this school year, and who knows how the next school year will begin, um, People are working from home or their schedules have significantly shifted. People who are older are in some higher risk categories and are being more careful. I think this is an opportunity to engage um, younger people in ongoing ongoing opportunities to serve the community. And I, I think that's just an opportunity that we absolutely should be looking at and, and making sure that we we do engage with the younger population in the church. I'd like to um, talk a little bit about about safety and about um, precautions that we need to consider before taking a mission journey. Um, we were just having a conversation with with um, our youth leadership at my, my church uh, about um, even if it's lawfully okay to go on a trip, should we go? Uh, is is that the best thing when we're working in a vulnerable population? Is that a best thing? Is that the best thing um, for our 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 teenagers um, to be grouped together uh, overnight? So as as things start to as restrictions start to lift, as gathering numbers start to go up, I, I wonder if you guys could chat a little bit about the the responsibility of the church um, to to protect our members, as well as those we're in mission together with, and maybe some practical ways that, um, that, that we need to, to consider. Well, as United Methodists, we first do no harm, right? So I think that's yeah. the first question that we ask ourselves. How, in what we're thinking about, how do we do no harm? And really sitting with that and spending time with that, One of the things, as I was recently teaching a confirmation class, one of the things, as we were talking about these three general rules, um, they asked, well, why does that do no harm come first? And the story I sort of told them was, well, if I, as a person, walked around a park and saw a bunch of holes in the ground, and I started filling in the holes because I wanted people to be safe, that's doing a good thing, right? And so we're going to do good and fill in the holes. Well, but first, I need to not dig the holes. 
There's no point in filling them if somebody's going to keep walking around digging the holes that people are going to fall in. So how are we not digging holes? How are we not creating an environment that could endanger people? That's the first question we've got to sit with. And then once we figured that out, how do we do good? That, that do no harm question is so important. As our church has been looking at how we bring back different ministries, we've, we've created a health and safety team um, our, with professionals from our church who are in the fields of medicine and public health and um, are connected in the school systems and the university. And um, they're, they're looking at all our, our ministries in terms of what are the, the low risk things in terms of the risk of, um, of doing harm. <laughs> what are the things where we, you know, if it's outside and we're definitely going to be able to keep six feet away and we can pretty much guarantee that everyone will wear masks. Um, that that's a low risk. It's going to be low numbers, but then some of the higher risk things are, for example, with, with children that it's very hard to, uh, keep children social distanced <laughs> and to, have them uh, follow all the the safety precautions that would need to be in place. Um, so for for us, that's meant a lot of the things that even though we would really want to be able to to start doing again in person, we just aren't aren't sure we're able to to say with confidence that you know this would this would do no harm um, bringing this ministry back at this time, going on this trip at this time. That's been a framework that we've been using. There was a. a- local group that was has gotten a grant to have a summer literacy program and so they were trying to think through how could they continue with a summer literacy program particularly now since kids have been learning at home small small children you know those early grade levels how do we how could we still do the summer literacy program to keep them on track or catch them up so they're ready for the fall, whatever comes in the fall for school, and thinking through, okay, we could sit across the table from each other and wear masks. Well, small children, even, you know, first and second graders, part of learning to read is being able to really watch how someone's mouth forms the words. So if I'm wearing a mask and trying to work with a child on reading, they can't see how my mouth is moving. And so it, even though I'm trying to do good and do the right things, is there, is the hope that what we're trying to do, is that actually being accomplished because they can't learn in the way that small children learn to read because I'm wearing a mask. Um, So ultimately they decided to postpone that learning opportunity, that service opportunity, because they just didn't feel like they could meet all of the, of the health and safety requirements and the, the goals of the ministry that they conflicted. And so you got to hit the pause button and do it later. One of the key themes that, that we discuss at the mission engagement team at a conference level and, and filters down to our churches is this di- idea of moving people from relief to empowerment. Um, right now we are in, in very much a, a relief mindset because people are, um, our food insecure, um, and people are are suffering loss of, of jobs and 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 income and and um, so um, I wonder if y'all will talk a little bit about um, this idea of moving people from relief to empowerment as we get back to some sense of, of normalcy, um, hopefully moving ahead. Well, there is an organization local to me um, in Salisbury that's doing a great job of that. And instead of giving people food, whether it's food that they've grown in their own garden, food from a local farmer, food from a grocery store, they are giving families garden kits, raised bed garden kits, and they're they're delivering to their house. And if need be, showing them how to set it up and grow things and checking in with them on the progress and everything's outside. So they're wearing masks and they're being safe, but it's about teaching people how to have a skill to be able to continue to move forward. And that has been a really a beautiful thing to watch, watch that happening 
uh, throughout this whole, you know, from the spring, even now, they're, they're able to show some of the gardens that are starting to grow and new gardens they are continuing to drop off. And I think that's a really one example of moving from relief to empowerment in a small way, in a small way. And so this is a time to think about how do we do that? Yeah. And I, I've been encouraged to see a lot of, a lot of folks having the conversation of, you know, our systems are broken and this is showing us how, how broken so many of our systems are. And um, it's, it's been encouraging to see a lot of discussion around mutual aid and this idea that everyone has gifts to offer. And just because you are needing some help with a a bill or a, a grocery box doesn't mean that you don't have anything that, that you also want to pay forward, to give back. And so just finding opportunities and forums for, for resource sharing, for people to be able to, to feel like they have something to contribute. Cause I mean, I've heard so, so much that people's identities have, have really been brought into question as, as the things that they formed their identity around have, have shifted, whether that's a loss of work or meaningful activities or hobbies um, or just how they usually spend their time. It's been theologically a way for us to, to recenter our, our identity as, as children of God, but also to be able to help people see what are ways that God can use them <laughs> right now. What are ways that, that we can, we can bear one another's burdens and, um, share the load and be able to create the kind of uh, resourceful <laughs> communities that, that we want to see and where, where everyone can thrive. Getting back a little bit to, to some of that maybe self-designed pressure that church leaders put on themselves. You know, I think oftentimes we feel like as church leaders, we need to, to create something. And sometimes um, there's things already happening in our community that we can come alongside, um, that we don't have to recreate um, something new, that a better use of our time and our resources and our people is to maybe uh, partner with, with organizations already doing the work or, or look for ways that um, we can fill in the gaps um, where there might be some, some things missing. So um, I think one of the things that, that we've identified on our, our team is, you know, that our school systems are, are feeding children and families in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, but there might be opportunities, um, on the weekend to, for churches to help out. Um, uh, I know Chris, you, you've talked about some of the resources that are now being offered that, um, are unique that can provide experiences, um, for people that, that we've never had before. So can you share a little bit about that? Well, yeah, the nonprofits across the globe are trying, they're losing, income and they're losing contributions, whether it's a zoo or a museum or any kind of entrance, you pay an entrance fee and you participate or see what they have to offer. They don't have people coming and they're not able to hold their fundraisers for their big donors. And and so they're trying every way they can to engage with their neighbors. And so instead of trying to recreate some kind of, I don't know, virtual experience or virtual learning, what if we just used what some of the nonprofits, again, across the globe have contributed or tried to put together? What if we we use the resources they're giving and sharing, the videos that they've shared time and time again, uh, and develop some kind of conversation around that? I mean, there's one nonprofit that uh, for all of our multiple Zoom calls we're all having, you can uh, give them a donation and have a llama show up in your Zoom call just for fun <laughs> to give everybody a little bit of laughter in the midst of the in the midst of the virtual conversation. What if we did that? What if we just partnered with the folks who are already doing the work and sent a donation to them in lieu of the time that I would spend to try and pull that all together? We have access to experts in just about everything now who are giving free content to keep their tribe engaged. We have access to that content. Let's use it. Yeah. So I I think uh, as we're thinking about all these wonderful virtual ways to connect and virtual opportunities, 
the the thing we do have to keep in mind is that um, not everyone has access. Not everyone has uh, internet access or devices to be able to use that, whether we're talking about folks in our own community or folks in other parts of the world, that, that those could be real barriers um, to connection. And so it both opens up an opportunity for creativity and other ways to connect, even when we can't be physically together. And I know we've mentioned writing letters and um, other other ways to, to be able to reach out, but also again, is a, a chance for us to advocate for that access, whether that's advocating with our school districts for folks to be able to keep hotspots and devices over the summer, which I know can have its you know, the school systems are under pressure too and having to re-up their devices uh, to be ready for the next school year or other other ways of making sure folks have access because in a, a time when we're relying so much on technology to stay connected, it can be really, really isolating and a real inequity, source of inequity for those who just don't have have the capability to have that access right now. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point, Laura. The um, this this um, pandemic has really peeled back that layer of, of digital inequity. I, I live in an urban setting in Charlotte, and and technology was provided for every student in our school district. The fact of the matter is, there's some places in our state that even if they were provided the technology, they wouldn't have the 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 internet capability to be able to to do the work that they needed to. So, I think that is one area of that the church can can maybe step in, and uh, I've heard of, of churches doing hot spots that cover their parking lot and inviting um, students to come in and do their work. So I think it opens up some interesting possibilities for how how the church can be uh, can and can reach the neighborhood, or the church can can help with that that gap in in technology. And there are opportunities too for the church, as um, the body of Christ, to engage in advocacy for widespread broadband internet um, in rural areas. I know there are state level advocacy groups that are working on that. And so if the church, particularly churches in rural areas are seeing that this is a, a major issue of equity right now, what if we partner with those state level agencies and, and be a voice of advocacy in our own local areas? I think that's a great opportunity for the church. Thank you for listening to Means of Grace, a podcast produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. We hope you've enjoyed listening to these podcasts and use them as a way to stay connected to our community. Remember to subscribe to Means of Grace for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us an honest rating and a review. It helps others find this podcast. Follow the WNCC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WNCCUMC. That's WNCCUMC. Means of Grace is produced by the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church and Gojo Studios.